This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from opentuition.com. We're looking at chapter 17, uh, which is headed up cost of capital. Uh, and in fact, for this and the next few chapters, they're all related to cost of capital. Uh, and what it is, you'll remember from the earlier chapters on investment appraisal, we spent all our time uh, working out, deciding what the cash flows were, we discount at the cost of money, the cost of capital to the company. But the question is, how do we calculate how much the capital is costing the company, especially bearing in mind that uh, some of that money will be coming from um, equity, from shareholders. Some of the money will be coming from um, debt lenders. Well, our job is to calculate the cost of capital, the uh, rate that we'll use when we're doing our discounting. And so uh, I need to look at the two bits separately. First of all, the cost of equity. Um, and the reason there's a, a cost attached to equity is, of course, if we borrow money from shareholders, not, not borrow, if we get money from shareholders, they'll be expecting a dividend. And if we raise more money from shareholders, we'll have to pay out more dividend. Well, that's equivalent, in a sense, to the interest. Uh, and if shareholders want a return of, let's say, 10%, the company's got to give them 10%. The rate the company's got to give them depends on the rate that they require. And how can we work out what rate the investors require? Well, effectively, we apply what we did in the last few chapters the other way around. Let me show you what I mean. SPLC, example one. SPLC has in issue $1 shares with a market value of $2.40 per share. A constant dividend of 30 cents per share has just been paid. And the question says, first of all, what is the shareholder's required rate of return? Well, effectively, we are doing what we did before, as I say, backwards. Why is the market value 240? It's because shareholders have said, ah, oh, we expect to get 30 cents a year dividend. What rate of return do we want? The two together gives us the market value. Here we just do it the other way around. And we say, well, the shareholders required return. If they're happy to pay 240 to get a return of 30 per annum, it must mean that they're requiring a return of 12.5 percent. Because if they wanted 15 uh, percent, they'd have fixed the market value lower. If they'd have been happy with 10%, the market value would have been higher. Uh, they were prepared to pay 240 because they expected 30 cents a year and they required a return of 12.5%. Now, okay, that's the shareholder's required rate of return. But some people say, well, why should the company care? When they issued the shares, they issued them for a dollar. And they're paying 30 cents a year dividend. That's 30 percent. Well, yes, except what we're interested in is the cost of raising more finance. You know, our existing finance may have been raised 20 years ago. It's already been invested. That's too late. We're thinking perhaps of doing a new project. It'll cost half a million. We're going to have to raise half a million. And if we're going to raise half a million today, we need to know what return shareholders will need, will want on that half million we're raising today. And whatever return they may have been happy with in the past, as of today, they can get 12.5% return by buying shares on the stock exchange. If I issue more shares, then 
shareholders are going to demand a 12.5% return. Otherwise, you know, they'll buy shares on the stock exchange. Now, the only thing there, of course, is we've assumed uh, a constant dividend. Again, as you saw in earlier chapters, more likely is there's a growing dividend. Well, we can still do it working backwards, the same sort of thing. You may remember, or you should remember, in the earlier chapter, when we were calculating the market value of a share, we used the formula on the formula sheet. P0 is D0 times 1 plus G over RE minus G. Well, that formula is given on the formula sheet, and we use that formula if we want to calculate the market value. But if we try um, suppose, a bit like the last one, suppose we know P0, we know the market value, it's quoted on the stock exchange, and we know what the current dividend is, and if we know what rate of growth is expected, we can use the same formula to work backwards and calculate what the shareholders' required rate of return is. Now here, either, if you're good at algebra, either be able to um, rearrange the formula quickly. Otherwise, because this is bound to be asked in the exam, it's such an important thing, I would learn the rearranged formula. If you rearrange, then RE, the shareholders' required rate of return, is D0 times 1 plus G over P0 plus G. I say, if you could at algebra, by all means, simply rearrange. Otherwise, don't waste your time. That formula will be needed in the exam. It is not given in the formula sheet. I would learn it. And let me check how we apply it. Look at... Um, Example two, T has in issue 50, P sh 50 cent shares at a market value of $4.20. A dividend of 40 cents per share has just been paid. Dividends are growing at 6%. Why is the market value $4.20? It's their expected dividends and their required rate of return. So let's work backwards. What is their required rate of return? The current dividend, 40 cents, times 1 plus the growth rate, 1.06, divided by uh, P0, 420, as before I'm doing everything in cents. So it was 40 cents dividend, 420 cents market value, plus G, the rate of growth, 0 0.06. Do check that you, I know it sounds silly, but you can get the right figure with your calculator. It's astonishing how many people write down the right thing and then end up with the most peculiar answer. 40 times 1.06 divided by 420. My calculator went wrong. 40 times 1.06 divided by 420 is point one zero one zero plus 0 0.06 equals point one six one zero or point one six one zero is sixteen point one zero percent. Now again, that's the rate of return shells are currently demanding. That's why they fixed the market value as they did. Well, if that's the rate they're currently demanding on the stock exchange, that's effectively how much finance is going to cost the company if they want to raise new finance from shareholders as of today. And so there is the cost of equity to the company. 
I say again, forget what dividends we're paying on the money that's already been raised years ago. That's been raised, that's been invested. This is our best estimate of the cost of raising more money from shareholders. I've said it, but I'll repeat it. If shareholders currently require 16% to invest in our shares on the stock exchange, if I'm going to raise more money from shareholders, I'm going to have to give them 16%. That's what they require. Uh, so it is very much to convince in a formula. Just check with example three. Um, they got an issue of dollar shares, market value of $3.60, dividends of 30 cents have just been paid, dividends growing at 8%. The required return, well again, D naught 1 plus G over P naught plus G. So the current dividend, <coughs> 30 cents. Uh, the growth rate, 8%.08. Uh, the market value, 3.60 cents plus G uh, gives me point one seven or 17%. Uh, two things. One I should have perhaps mentioned before. Uh, generally in the exam, um, leave the calculation to two decimal places. Obviously, it's not relevant in the second example, three. Uh, secondly, unlikely to be relevant, but do remember that P0 is the X div market value. And so, without redoing it, in example three, if it had said a dividend of 30 cents was about to be paid, well, if the cum-div market value is 360, the ex-div market value, we'd subtract 30 cents, and it's the ex-div value that you use in this formula. OK, well, that's fair enough. And again, that will definitely be asked in the exam. There's absolutely no doubt it's always there. Uh, and I've already said, uh, if I were you, I would learn the formula. You won't have time in the middle of the exam to rearrange the P0 formula. Uh, there's one way in which you can make that a bit more interesting, which is to do with the growth rate. In all those, both those examples we've just done, you were told dividends are growing at 6%, at 8%. And very often he does tell you the rate of growth. However, he can expect you to estimate the rate of growth, which you'll then use in the formula. And there are two ways he can ask you to do it. The first, perhaps the most obvious, is to look at past dividend growth. You know, I think if I asked you, Oh, here's a company. What rate of growth do you expect in the future? You'll probably look back and say, well, in the past it's been about 3% a year. Fine, let's assume it's 3% a year in the future. And so that's what's happening here. Have a look at example four. The, it's now the year 2001. And X has paid out the following dividends in past years. In 96, they paid 28,000. In 97, 29,000. 98, 32,000. 99, we oh, went down a bit, 31,000. Uh, and 2,000, 33,000. Uh, uh, now, obviously, the rate of growth hasn't been constant. You know, there it went up by 1,000 on 28, whatever percent that is. Here it went up a lot, 3,000 on 29, so more than 10%. Here it went up 
Here he went down a bit, it was negative growth. Here he went up by 2,000 or 31. So the rate of growth changes each year. Um, we want the average rate of growth over that period. Now, in fact, you can work out the growth each year and take an average, but it's what we call a geometric average. You multiply together and take a root. And in fact, there's no need. All we do is this, and watch me carefully, because it's very hard for me to write this as a formula. We take the earliest dividend, which is 28,000. Now we're after the average growth rate. So if the average growth rate was G, then surely you'd be expecting on average that after one year, it would grow to 28 times 1 plus G. After two years, 1 plus G squared. After three years, 1 plus G cubed, and so on. Well, how many years growth have there been here on the information we're given? Be careful, people say five, but it isn't. It grew one year, two year, three year, four year. And so it's grown, there's four years of growth. You would expect it, therefore, to have grown to 28 times 1 plus g to the fourth. If it's growing at an average of g per annum. And what has it grown to? Well, the latest dividend is 33,000. Now, again, appreciate we're after the average growth. So clearly, some years it's grown more, some years less. But over that period, the average rate of growth per year must be G from that equation. Uh, and so dividing both sides by 28, 1 plus G to the fourth is 33,000 divided by 28,000, which is what? One point one seven eight five seven one whatever. It's better to leave that in your calculator. One plus g, therefore, must be the fourth root of that. And what is the fourth root? Uh, ooh, let me clear this. The fourth root. Sorry, fourth root. I do beg your pardon. Uh, the fourth root. Uh, you should have a fourth root button, or else take the square root twice. But the fourth root oh, sorry. Over one point one seven eight five seven. It's one point oh four one nine three. G therefore. Uh, that minus one is 0 0.04193 or 4.193 percent. So do make sure I mentioned earlier some, somewhere you do have to have a scientific calculator. Uh, make sure you can use it. Four through it isn't square root twice if you find that easier, but there's no reason why I couldn't give you one with three years growth, five years growth, you know, third root or fifth root. But there we are. So there's the growth rate which you would then use in the formula we had earlier for the cost of equity. Anyway, that's one way you can ask you to estimate growth, look at past growth and assume that will continue in the future. The other though is something called RB growth. And here, in case there's a bit of written, just let me explain before I illustrate and show you the numbers. Why do dividends grow? You know, from year to year, all sorts of reasons. Company can decide to pay an extra dividend this year or a lower dividend. But in the long term, if you ignore inflation, in the long term, dividends can only grow if profits are growing. And why do profits grow? 
Again, in the long term, profits will only grow if the company's expanding. You know, buying more machines, therefore earning more profit. But how can a company keep expanding? They need finance to expand. Well, the only way they can keep in the long term raising more money each year is by retaining earnings. RB growth is the fact that growth is due to retaining earnings. And let me show you exactly what I mean. The little illustration on the next page. You'd never have to do this, but it only takes a second and it should explain what this RB growth is. Two companies there. Company A has earnings of $100 and it's all paid out as dividend. So they've got nice big dividends, but if they're not retaining, they've no money to expand and there's no reason why the earnings should increase. So if you're giving it all as dividend, you've got a nice high dividend, but there is no growth. But look at company B. As of now, they've got the same earnings. But they're deciding to retain 60%. And so, of course, the dividend is only 40, a much lower dividend. But what about next year? Next year, presumably, they're still getting 100 from their existing operations. But that 60 they retained, they'll have invested and that'll earn more profit. And if they're investing at 10%, as it says, retained earnings are reinvested at 10, well, at 10%, that will give them an extra six earnings. Every year from then on. So you've now got earnings 106. And if they keep the same retention policy, 60% will be retained. The rest will go as dividend. They've had higher earnings, they get higher dividend. And just to make sure you've got it, one more year. They're now earning 106 a year. But they've just reinvested another 63.6. And so that'll earn them at 10% an extra 6.36. Their earnings will go up now to 112.36 a year. But every year when they retain and invest, the earnings increase. And if they keep the same retention policy of 60%, they'll be retaining 67.416. The dividend goes up yet again. And so see what's happening. Because they're retaining earnings, they're expanding the company, their profits increasing each year. And if the profits are increasing each year, so too the dividend will increase each year. Company B has a much lower dividend, but they've got a growing dividend. We've got this growth. And with the growth, you can work it out yourself. 2.4 on 40. That year it grew by 6%. The next year, it's gone up by 2.544 on 42.4. Again, 6%. And by all means, try a third year and see what happens. Provided they keep the same retention policy that they always retain 60%. And provided they're able to reinvest it at here 10%, then the growth will be 6% per year. And we can forecast it. The growth rate 
is r times b, where b is the proportion retained and where r is the return on reinvestment. And so for this little illustration, it's there at the bottom anyway, but they're uh, getting a return of 10%, they're retaining 60%, the growth will be 6% per year. And that formula is given you on the formula sheet. So two more examples using that, and uh, then we'll have a break before we have the next lecture. Now, example five, Y retains 40% each year, reinvests those to earn 20% a year. What's the expected growth rate? Well, the return on investment, 20%. The retention, 40%. You'll be expecting dividend growth, therefore, at 8% per year. Uh, finally, for this lecture, example six. Z has in issue a do uh, dollar shares with a market value of $2.80. A dividend of 20 cents per share has just been paid. The earnings per share were 32 cents. They're able to invest so as to earn a return of 18%. A, what's the rate of growth in dividends? Well, we know they can reinvest at 18. The retention rate, though, the earnings per share are 32 cents. The dividend per share was 20 cents. And so they've retained 12 cents. And so what percent are they retaining? Uh, the retention rate, 12 on 32, they're retaining 37.5% of their earnings. And so what's the growth rate, dividend growth rate, going to be? Ah, the rate of return on reinvestment is 18%. Retention rate, 37.5%. And so the dividend growth rate, 6.75%. Part B, estimate the cost of equity. Well, back to what we had earlier, using the formula. Uh, the cost of equity, uh, D naught 1 plus G over P naught plus G. No problem. The current dividend, 20 cents. 1 plus the growth rate of 6.75. Sorry, 1.0675. Uh, divided by the market value, 280 plus G, I get a, a cost of equity of fourteen point three seven five. I've said before, you're always in the exam be required to uh, use that formula, and usually several times in the exam. Sometimes he tells you the growth rate. Other times he expects you, depending on the information given, obviously, to either use past dividends or to use uh, the RB model. Finally, a little extra I threw in here. Estimate the market value per share in two years. Think about it. Look back at that model in a minute. If the company keeps retaining, then they're expanding the company. The company's going to be worth more. And 
The dividends are growing. The market value is going to grow as well. The market value of the shares. And I would remember this or learn it. It's not very common he asks this, but he could. The market value of the shares will grow at the same rate as dividends. Think about it. The market value of the share today is the present value of future dividends. Uh, come back in a year's time and the market value in a year's time. There'll be present value of the then future dividends. But a year from now, all the dividends are higher by a year's growth. As the dividends grow, the market value will grow. The market value currently is $2.80. Dividends are growing at 6.75% a year, and therefore, so will the market value of the shares. In two years' time, two years' growth, 1.0675 squared, gives me an expected market value of, to the nearest cent, $3.19. OK, well, that deals with the cost of equity. Uh, the other bit is cost of debt. Well, the lecture's getting too long. Um, we'll stop this one here. In the next lecture, we'll look at the cost of debt.